the day the Israelites, they found themselves in a situation where it felt like things would never change. You see, they have been in exile for a long time. They have been moved out of their homeland, the land that God had promised them, and the Babylonians have forced them into exile, not just exile, but forced them out in the desert. Amen? And see, while they were out there in the desert, they felt imprisoned by their past, and they felt that nothing would ever get better. I'm sure some of you feel like that sometimes. You've been in a place and you just feel like nothing ever is going to get better. Amen? Amen. And so at the time, you see, the uh, Israel, they were in Babylon. And, and, and during their time there, they had been used, you see, and the, they had been abused. They were treated like slaves. They had been treated like outcasts. They were the least of these. They were abused by their oppressors, the Babylonians, and they had lost all hope. But while they were in the desert, you see, uh, you know how we do sometimes. Some folk will actually begin to do okay. They have been there for so long, they say, well, let me adjust to my situation. Mm, mm. In fact, some folk were even prospering. They stopped thinking about their captivity. They stopped thinking about their exile. They stopped thinking about the fact that they were in the desert. And they said, this is how it is. Mm. This is how it's always going to be. You see, they accepted their fate of never escaping the desert. They accepted the fate that they would never escape their current circumstances, and they settled in for the long haul. Uh, right. uh. You see, they began to get a little too comfortable, and their still dire situation it hadn't gotten better. It was still a dire situation. They were still away from home. They were still exiled in the desert. But they began to get a little comfortable. And they got a little bit lethargic in their attitudes about who they were. You know, God had told them that they were the chosen ones. Yeah. But they had forgot all about that. They said, this is who I am now. I might as well go ahead and accept my fate. It got to the point, church, where they weren't really looking to improve their relationship with God or, or with each other. They thought they adjusted pretty well to being in exile. They thought they adjusted to this new kind of reality. They began to feel like this is it. God can't really do anything for me anymore. Mm. So rather than being wounded one more time, you know how we get wounded and we feel hurt and hurt and hurt one more time. They settle for the status quo. And they refused to look forward. Uh. And then right at the moment, when all seemed dark and dreary, and there was no hope for escaping exile, that's when God stepped in and announced to the Israelites that Babylon would fall. You see, that's good news. Yeah, yeah. They had been in exile for years, and he said, Babylon would fall. They were all rejoicing in the streets. Yeah. God said, I am the Lord, your Holy One, I am your creator and your king. And your Don't king. you worry about a thing. I got this situation under control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the scripture tells us that the Israelites, hearing God's promise to deliver them from exile, they began to remember, you see, with a smile on their face, how God had delivered them in the past and had led them to victory. That was good news because they saw how what God could do. They remember way back in Egypt land when they were trapped and had nowhere to go and how God had made a way for them out of nowhere. Yeah. You remember how God parted the mighty waters of the Red Sea yeah. and provided them protection and a lighthouse to the promised land. You remember the story in Exodus? Yes, yes. Remember what God had done for them, you see, had provided them a sense of comfort, provided with the fact that we serve a powerful God. That's right. They surmised that if God had delivered them out of Egypt by the sea, that God would do the same thing one more time one more and time. in the same way to lead them out of Babylon. Yeah. They thought that just like before, God would raise up a deliverer among them. Mm. You know, a Moses-type figure who would divide the Euphrates River this time so that they would be able to cross over on dry land. And then the deliverer, this new deliverer, will bring the river back over the Babylonian army and drown them all 
Do you see the parallel with the Exodus story? Yes, yes. That's how they thought that God was going to deliver them. This time it makes perfect sense that they would think that, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. But God said, here it is. Forget about the past. Forget about how I delivered you before. Right, right. Forget about the sea. God said, don't you know who I am? Come on. I can deliver you in any way that I choose. In fact, I will make a way for you right here in the desert. Yeah. I will make a way for you right here in exile. I will make a way for you right here in the valley. I will make a way for you in your current circumstances. Come on, preacher. I will make a way for you even though you're unemployed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will yeah, make yeah, a way yeah. for you although you ain't got no money. I will make a way for you although your electricians are going silent. God said, I don't need the sea to deliver you. Right. I will make a way out of no way. Yeah, come on. All right, now. You see, in my Holy Ghost imagination, God said, I'm so bad. I'm going to transform this here desert, this desert that was created by the arrogance of the Babylonians, and make it into a place of water and streams. He said, I'm so bad. I'm going to make it a beautiful place. All right now. A beautiful place. Yeah, yeah. Where the wild animals were roam, and where you, my chosen people, will have all of your needs supplied. Yes, yes, yes. Your, your needs supplied not out of the de desert. But while you're in the desert, God said, you're not going to be stuck no more in this desert, desert situation. I came to tell you today that I'm about to do a new thing, and together we are going to move forward. Yeah. Church, I want you to hear this. God came to revive, reconcile, and restore Israel's relationship with God and help them to restore their relationship in their families and in their community in a brand new way. Yes. I love it. But in order for us to revive, reconcile, and restore their relationships, God needs the Israelites back then and needs us today to recognize that we have to do things differently. And so for those of you who like points, y'all ready for the points? Come on, Pastor. Point number one is we got to stop dwelling in the past. That's right. That's right. Write this down. Take, I'm taking a pop quiz later on. Don't dwell <laughs> in the past. Amen. Number two, be open to new possibilities. All right. All right. Three, believe in the power of positive thinking. And number four, be committed to the relationship. Mm. I'm going to say that one time. Number one, stop dwelling in the past. Yeah. Number two, be open to new possibilities. Number three, be positive in your thinking. And four, be committed to the relationship. Amen? Amen. Now, point number one, don't dwell in the past. One of the first things that God told them to do is stop dwelling on what I used to do and focus on what I'm about to do in the here and the now. Amen? Amen. God told the Israelites that they were dwelling too much on what had happened to them in the past. And it's understandable that they would do so because it's always easier to look back, isn't it? Yes. To focus on what's going on right, right in front of you. It is. Now, beloved, we're going to have, y'all know, when we preach together, we always have group therapy. Amen. So turn to somebody and say, we have group therapy. We have group therapy. Okay, <laughs> hey, Pastor Sherry charges, what do I charge now? $150 an hour. So you save a couple of hours, a couple hundred dollars. <laughs> I don't even know that. I, because I discount everybody, I don't even know if my fee is anymore. Amen. Amen. So when I have couples in counseling, this is one of the hardest challenges, to tell couples to stop bringing up stuff from the past. So turn to somebody and say, I'm not. I'm not. Gonna bring up. Gonna bring up. up anything. Anything. That happened. That, that happened. happened. In the past. In the past. Now what I call this is stop having history lessons. On September 7, 2009, you said this. And then on February 3rd, 2011, you did that. Amen. And the main reason we tell couples to stop dwelling on the past is because, one, you can't change what happened in the past. Okay. Right. Amen. It's already done. And number two, most importantly, it, it distracts you from focusing on the solution. Listen to what I'm saying. When you stay stuck with what happened three years ago, how is that solving the problem in front of you right now? Talk about it. Amen. Come on. Come on. I will tell couples in the session, stop doing that. They'll keep on. Yeah, but see, she said, like, if you hadn't done this, I would have said that. I would say, stop. Stop. Amen? Now, the reasons we tend to focus on the past, I'm going to help you understand why you do that so you don't have to do that no more. Amen? You are convinced 
that if you let somebody know how ticked off you are, they'll never do it again. <laughs> and number two, we believe that if somebody really loves us, they would have ticked us off in the first place. Mm. Amen? Y'all don't think that's true? Y'all are my on your street. Mm. All right, now. Somebody say, ouch. <laughs> so let's dispel some myths so we can move forward in 2014. Amen? First of all, I, amen? Amen, amen, Pastor. First of all, it is not realistic to think that your honey bunny will never tick you off. That's right. So yeah, let's man. just get rid of that. <laughs> I see y'all looking at each other on the side. Ain't no sideways glances now, amen? We all looking forward. Look at me. Look at me. Keep your eyes on me. <laughs> <laughs> now, how many of you all get angry at yourself sometimes? Sometimes you get really angry at something you did. You just think it was ridiculous or it was stupid. <laughs> Everybody should be raising their hand. How many of you get angry at yourself sometimes? Okay. Now, at least in theory... You know yourself better than anybody else but Jesus, amen? That's right. So if you can mess yourself up and tick yourself off that much, don't you think that somebody else who doesn't know you quite as well or occasionally at least make you angry? Somebody say, now, come on now. <laughs> amen? Amen. amen. Okay. We're going to be honest now, okay? Be real fast. Now, if we think that we resurrect these old hurts and these wounds and misunderstandings, you think that once you cuss them out real good, Real good. You, you save up your words. You know, just like you. I save up your words for years. Amen. <laughs> one more I go, yes. Shanene can come out of retirement and we can just go to what we know. Amen. Amen. If you cuss them out really good, they will never do that again. Amen. And let me give you another news flash. It is really hard for someone to remember every single thing that bothers you. How about that? Particularly if, and this is what I had to come to, we've been married 28 years, if it's not important to the other person. Mm. If it's not something that bothers them or is really important to them, it's hard for them to every time before they open their mouth say, oh, that's right, Paul don't like it when I do this, so I ain't going to do that right now. Because every once in a while, we're thinking about ourselves, amen? Mm. I'm really thinking about you. Turn to somebody and say, sometimes, sometimes I'm not thinking about you. I'm just not even thinking about you. It's, it's okay. It's okay. All I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. So you, you go home and say, Reverend Sherry made me say that. They got a new She made me say that. <laughs> Amen. Now, now, let me, we're going to give y'all uh, an example. Uh, Reverend Hall is not here today, but he always says, have an application. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'm going to be real transparent. Probably, I'm much better now, but the first, what, five, ten years of our marriage, maybe? Yeah. yeah. I would cuss in front of Pastor Guy. Yes. <laughs> and I can't believe with this sweet innocent face. I can't believe Before she was called to. I knew Jesus, but I wouldn't call him ministry. And I can, Reverend Paul and I would laugh at this. We like the potty mouth queen. We can just go. And, hey, hey, hey. And so I would say things, and I was not cussing Pastor Guy out. I want to be clear. I, was, I, don't, I never name call. I don't use the blades and all that. But I would be upset. I would not even necessarily be upset with him. But I would just be upset about something, and I would say the four-letter words very colorfully, because I would practice this, since I could combine them in certain ways that would be unique. And then I, <laughs> so I would do that, and, and, and he would get really upset with me. And, and he, I know he's a big man. A lot of y'all are scared of him, but he's really a teddy bear. And then, but he, when he gets angry, he blows up like the Hulk. And so he would get like, Sherry? And when you, if you do that to me, if you try to scare me, then I would say, uh-uh-uh. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I'm not the one. I tell you, I am the one. So it's really a bad idea. You know, I can't fight. Don't, don't try to scare me. Amen? Because I'm like, I ain't scared of you. And so we would have these loud arguments. He'd be yelling at me, and I'd be right up in his face, too. I ain't scared of you. Amen? And so to me, I was like, what is the problem? Because I'm not cussing you out. I'm just cussing. Mm -hmm. This really don't have nothing to do with you. I'm just expressing how I feel. Amen? Now, that's my side of the story. And I'm going to let Pastor, because we equal, amen, I'm going to let him tell his side of the story. Well, the cussing thing, I guess it goes back to my childhood and how I was raised. And I just never liked to hear women cuss. And I'm one of the most progressive, equal opportunity men there is today in the 21st century. And I know it may be sexist to say it, but I just don't like to hear women cuss. Now, I remember when I was working in the U.S. Attorney's Office, a whole bunch of lawyers, nobody cusses more than lawyers. They cuss more than sailors. And so everybody's in there just cursing away. 
And when I heard some of my female friends cursing when I considered to be trying to keep up with the men, trying to fit in, it would just send chills through my body. And I just absolutely hated it. And so when I came home, after hearing that stuff at work, I didn't want to hear it coming out of my honey butt. And so that was a thing that just really, really, really bothered me. The fact that my wife would curse like that. Amen? Now, the solution to that problem was not for me to say, well, you need to get over it. The solution to the problem was for me to stop cussing. And when I, we came to that, it took a couple of years. Because <laughs> I kept trying to convince him, I'm not trying to, I don't understand. I'm not cussing you. I said, what's the problem? And then I told him, you're sexist. You know, you can cuss and so can I. Although, friends to him, he rarely cusses. Rarely, rarely cusses. And I didn't grow up with people cussing. I, my father was 87. I've never heard my father curse. And I could probably count two hands the time I heard my mother curse. So it wasn't like I grew up in a house like that. But I think I grew up because at one point I was trying to fit in, amen? And so I started doing that. And so I stopped doing it not because I thought he was right, because I still don't quite understand why that bothers him. I stopped doing it because it bothered him. And because I love him, I don't want to do something that bothers him. Ooh, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Just like, you know, you all think, I used to smoke. When we got married, I smoked, not often, but I did, and it, he hated it. And our first fight was. We're talking about cigarettes, y'all. Cigarettes, yes, cigarettes. <laughs> Legal products, amen. And I mean, our first fight was he would not take me to the store to buy cigarettes, and I didn't have a car. So I was walking on the highway to go to 7 Eleven to get the cigarettes. And when I got there and I was on my way back, I thought, you know what? I could have been killed for a cigarette. So I took the cigarette that I told her I will never smoke again. Remember, I broke them up. I threw them in the toilet. That was, like I can tell you, it was in July of 1986 because we got married in June. It was a month after we were married. And that's the last time I smoked. Why? Because it bothered him. Amen? Because it bothered him. That's why you do it. Amen? Amen. Mm. So myth number two that we also need to dispel this morning, this afternoon, is that when people love you a whole lot, they won't hurt you. Amen. The very people who love that you are closest to are the most damaged. Let me say it again. Amen. The people who are closest to you, whether they mean to or not, hurt you the most. If they if they do it intentionally, it's because they know your spots. Right? And some of y'all don't look up, don't don't raise your hand. Some of you all fight, you go for the jugular. You don't take no prisoners. You you intentionally go there. Now, I will say in the 20 years that we've been married, we've never done that to each other. We don't, we don't go there. But we do unintentionally hurt each other because we care. So when he hurts me, it is devastating because I love him so much. You see what I'm saying? If you did the same thing, I'd be like, okay, whatever. But when he does it, when I think he doesn't get me, that hurts me. Because I'm like, of all people... You're my shelter. You're supposed to get me when nobody else gets me. Amen. You better talk up in here. Come on now. But having said that, and I'm not going to be going to start crying again, but no one has ever loved me the way he loved me. That's why we've been married before. Amen. Because he loves me. He has never asked me to change. Never. He has never said, if you could just, he'll, you know what he'll say to me is, this is frustrating that you do that, but I still, we always say, I still love you. I will just have to figure this out. And I tell him that. Amen? So, having said that, it's you have to understand, it is not realistic for you to think that someone will always put their the other person's needs before their own. That's not realistic. Even when you love the way we love, you think about yourself first sometimes. And that's human nature. Turn to someone and say, that's human nature. That's human it's nature. human nature to think about yourself first. Amen? Amen? Yes, sometimes we think about the other person, but every once in a while, and I've been married this long, I don't feel like thinking about him first. I want to think about myself. Amen? The other day, I was laying in bed reading a romance novel. He said, baby, you'll get out of bed? I said, nope. You'll cook dinner? No. Why? Because I don't feel like it. <laughs> right, now, did I know he was trying to? Yes. But did I know he was No. And so I didn't. <laughs> Yeah, come on. Sometimes, even when you love someone like that, you don't put them first. Mm. And so, yeah, even though we kind of intellectually know that, we keep replaying these same wounds, these same misunderstandings over and over again. It's like you have a CD of all your hurts, and you got a scratch on it. And it just has that little hiccup effect, you know, 
records go Ch -ch -ch -ch. Those of you who remember records go Ch -ch -ch -ch. Amen? Yeah. And so it's over and over again because you don't believe that someone who professes to love you the way your honey bunny does will hurt you like that. Mm. And I'm telling you this morning to free you up, get over it. Because every once in a while, someone is going to devastate you. And you're not going to break. You're not going to fall apart. Not because of you, but because of God. Mm. That's why you're not going to fall apart. Amen? Amen. So when you keep reviving people's past mistakes, you make your relationship stay stuck in the past. It doesn't solve the problem, and it doesn't solve anything. And plus, when someone keeps bringing up what you did wrong, they feel attacked. And when people feel attacked, they do one or two things. They either shut down, which, by the way, is a power play. Turn to somebody say, it's a power play. It's a power play. You, a power speak, play. You, shut, you shut everything down, don't you? Because now you can't talk about it. Another person's frustrated, so it's a power play. I'm just trying to get myself together. It's a power play. Amen? And secondly, or the person's going to bite you back. And then they're going to bring us something that you did. Uh-huh. And then you have the tit for tat show. You did this, well, see, if you hadn't done that, I would have done that. And then, by the way, meanwhile, back at the farm, is the conversation, is the problem being solved? No. no. So now you are completely derailed, amen? You're getting further and further from the solution of the problem. And the only thing you're accomplishing is you're hurting each other more and more. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So one of the ways I'm going to help you today get back on track is to keep the conversation in the here and now. And for those of you who don't currently have a honey bunny, this works with roommate. This works, this is like communication one-on-one. -on -one. It works in every situation. Keep it in the here and now. It works with your parents. Amen. Hello? Amen. Ah. My own children remind me, Mom, you stop talking about the past. And they're right. Hello? No, you can't have the car because you always come late. Mom will be. Give them, give them a chance. Maybe this time, no, hallelujah. They'll be on time. Amen. <laughs> Focus on the present, not the past. Mm. Focus on solutions, not the problems. That's and right. then finally, take responsibility for your own behavior Come and on. your own feelings. Yes. Amen? Amen. You make me, I can't nobody make you do nothing. Can't nobody nothing. make you do nothing, that's right. Okay. See, I can't, I get upset. We are not animals, amen. We are higher beings with a brain. Amen. amen. Can't nobody make, now I'm not saying that someone can't upset you, but it is your choice how to respond to them. That's right. That's Amen. right. Amen. Stop blaming other people for your behavior. And for all of us who have messed up childhood, which is everybody in the room, get over it. Amen. I'm a psychologist. I'm telling you, move on. Okay? There's Oprah's got to do her show no more. Jerry Spring, I don't think it's on anymore either. Ricky Lake, they all gone now. Move on. Amen? And the reality shows are ridiculous, so don't put your dirty laundry on the reality show. Amen? You can control your own thoughts and your own feelings. And you, many of you all know I did a sermon a while ago about that's the best they can do. Sometimes your mama and your dad, that's all they can do. That's it. Okay, so get over it and move on, amen? And use your brain. A mind is really a fearful thing to waste. So use your brain, amen? Now, it's not, Isaiah is not saying we should completely ignore the past, you see. Mm -hmm. Because the past is important. We should learn something from our past experiences. And when we learn something from our past experiences, we should be better people as a result. Amen? That's right. The past, you see, also reminded the Israelites of what God did for them throughout history. And remembering the past, you see, is comforting. Mm -hmm. Because it reminds you of the power of God. You know, I like to say sometimes when I think back, over my life and all the things that God has done for you, for me, I just have to say, hallelujah. That's a good thing when you think back on the things that God has done for you because you know God is going to do it again. That's right. But you see, dwelling on the past made those Israelites blind to the possibilities of new beginnings. That's right. Because you see, when you dwell in the past too long, you tend to live in the past. That's right. Church, we have to recognize that God can provide uh, 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 new ways because God is the divine creator that God can create something out of nothing. God can do a brand new thing. Verses 16 to 17 reminded the Israelites of how God delivered them out of the wilderness during the Exodus experience to remind them just who God is 
that God is the ultimate deliverer, that God is the great I am, that God is worthy to be praised. Amen. But then God turns right around in verses 18 and 19, and he says, forget the past. Don't be imprisoned by what happened yesterday or how I delivered you the last time. You see, I am the creator God. I got tricks up my sleeve that you can't even imagine. I can deliver you in a new way. I can do a new thing, and I can do it even more miraculous and better than the last time. Yeah. Just watch me. Why? Because that's just the kind of God that I am. You never know how I'm coming, but best believe when you need me, I'm there. Sometimes we get so stuck in the past that we're not open to new possibilities that our God can provide. Come on. Or maybe you don't like that job. Maybe you're not sure if the path that you're on is the really right for you. You know, we go through so many things in our life. We try this out. We try that out. We're just not quite sure. We, but sometimes we've been doing it for so long that we're scared. We're in fear of going and looking at what the unknown is. Taking a chance on life. Mm. Doing your passion. Seeing if it work out. We get stuck in the past. Sometimes we jump on the path because it's the demon we know. Mm -hmm. Despite how dysfunctional or despite how bad it is for us, it's called the spirit of fear. Sometimes we, uh, we rather stay stuck in toxic relationships rather than venture out into the unknown of a new relationship. Mm. Your night and shining all might be right around the corner. You see, we feel more comfortable doing things the way we've always done them. Yeah, that's even if they don't work out for us. <laughs> the funny thing about it is many times when we look back on our past, you know, months or years later, uh -huh. you realize that that relationship wasn't all that much anyway. <laughs> you know, that you've been looking at the past through rose-colored rose glasses. Rose-colored glasses. <laughs> it happened to me that way. Mm. And I was thought I was all in love with my college sweetheart. <laughs> a little bit later, she came and broke my heart. Mm. I thought my world had come to an end. Mm. Mm. And then a few years later, I met Pastor Shea. Woo! <laughs> I let the past be the past. <laughs> I began to live into the future. And God set me up for the best thing that ever happened to me. Preach! Preach! Say it so! Sometimes you got to leave the past in the past. You see, we can be our own worst enemy. That's right. We are the ones who are standing in the way of newer, healthier relationships. That's right. Get out of your own way. That's right. We become so lulled into the nostalgia of an old relationship. And are still stuck in the midst of how it used to be, how we used to be as a couple, Come on. or how we used to be as a family, or how we used to be in the community back in the day. Back in the day. But guess what, y'all? We ain't back in the day no more. Hey! You know, people change and communities change and uh, the world changes and relationships change. That's right. Yes, they do. But the question is. What are you doing to make your current relationship vital? Mm. How many of you know that you can't be a passive participant in your own relationship with God Amen. or with each other? You see, it takes work. Mm -hmm. It takes creativity. It takes vulnerability. Mm -hmm. It takes persistence and perseverance and understanding Oh, it takes sacrifice. Mm. It takes commitment. It takes honesty. It takes trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And most of all, it takes L-O-V-E. That's right. Love. Amen. Beloved, in order for us to be open to new possibilities to move forward, we also need to think about the power of positive thinking. Turn to somebody and say, the power, the power of positive thinking. Of positive thinking. Now, if you need 
a new job or a new career, you need to do well in your classes, or you need to improve your relationship, you've got to think about it positively. That's Amen? Right. Mm -hmm. And Pastor Gary talked about the fact that God would, had taken them out of, of Egypt a long time ago in the Exodus, and they were leaning on that situation. But God was also telling them, you know what? Because I am so all that in a bag of chips, I can take you out of your situation without moving you. All right. Ooh. Think about that. Deep. Because we want to be delivered out of the desert. Sometimes the blessing is in the desert. You better and talk up in here. So sometimes right. you go begging and God and slotting and caring about God, please take me out. God's like, you act like the only way I can do this is to move you to another place. I can create an oasis wherever I am. You know that's Amen. right. Amen. And so we got to think about that. The other issue is you got to stop thinking and being limited by your current situation. And some of the reasons why we do that is because we get so caught up in negative thinking. Can I have a witness? Amen. Now, in psychology, this is our group therapy one more time. There's a therapy that's called cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. And basically, in a nutshell, it's much more complicated than this, but it teaches you how to think positively. Mm. It teaches you how to, what we always say at BCC, reframe, reframe your experience. Amen? Amen. See, when you allow your decisions to be guided by negative thinking, it's hard to move forward because... You have such low expectations of yourself and other people. Mm. Your relationship can't possibly get better, so how can it? No one will ever really love you. And if you carry that aura with you, I'm unlovable, then you attract people to you who feed off of that energy. Mm. Let me say that again. One of the things I was so, it was so weird. Before I met Pastor Guy, I told people I wasn't going to get married. And people, I was too independent. I was tired of blah, 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 blah. And so I met Pastor Guy. I felt hell of hills of love, love at first sight. Negroes came out of all kinds of woodwork, <laughs> off the roof, in the chandelier. And I literally, I could walk down the street, people like, can I get? And I was like, where were y'all a year ago? <laughs> and I realized the difference was not so much that I looked any different, but I was so confident. When this man loved me the way he loves me even now, I was like, when I walk in the room, even now, I own the room. Speak. You know I, I'm like, excuse me. When I walk into my class, I'm like, I'm here now. You can be quiet. Now you can. Now you can be. <laughs> And not an arrogant way. <laughs> not, a, this is what I'm not an arrogant way. But it's a way that says, I know who I am. So one of the things I tell my junior colleagues is, I don't ask someone to be their professor. I am your professor. That's what I mean by that. I, I am who I am. I'm not asking you to make me the professor. I am the professor. So my other colleagues got people looking at the email and stuff like that, coming to class late. People don't come to my class late. They just don't. You have one time to do that. And I don't even say nothing. I give you just give you the Dr. Moloch look. So and I will embarrass you in front of everybody, so you don't want to go there with me, amen. Don't go there with me. Because I, I this is a smile, but it can turn into something else. And so my point is that you have to have confidence in who you are. Amen. And so those of you who I have students who come to class and are so obsessed because they fail the first test. And then they don't come to class and stop trying. Like, look, we got three more exams and four papers to go. You can make this up. Don't give up. Amen? That's right. Just because one bad thing happens in your day, some of you are, my whole day messed up now. No, it's not. It's just, it's 10 a.m. You got, what, 12 more hours to go. Amen? I missed my bus. Okay, well, get back up. I fell down and ran my stock. Well, take them off. Go to CVS and get another pair. Come on, Amen? Amen? Don't let things derail you. That's Amen? Right. That's because right. when you do that, when you allow negative thinking to rule your life, you act like God is not omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Right. You better say that thing. You better say it. You act like the God that can create the universe by speaking it into existence. <laughs> that the God that can create something out of nothing. That the God that was saying God's only begotten son that so you might have life and have it more abundantly. That God can't pull you out of blessing so much so that you don't have room enough to receive it. What God are you reading about? You better you talk. You're reading about a different God, amen? Right now. And the sad thing is that your negative thinking becomes self fulfilling prophecy. That's right. Now, for all of the single folks in the room, this is for you. We're going to, in 2014, we're not going to do the butt stuff anymore, amen? The butt skates. We're not going to. Everybody say, I'm not doing butt no more. Not doing I'm not butt. doing butt. Okay, in fact, this is for everybody. I don't want to hear no one say, I want a promotion, but my supervisor hates me. I want a life partner, but I'm too heavy, I'm too thin, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too whatever. Okay, all everybody, let's get rid of that. Amen? Okay. Y'all with me? Amen. With you. Because if you don't believe that the God of the universe, the God of the galaxies, 
So we just talked about the God to the earth because that's the only thing we know. It's a planet. You know there are larger systems in that, right? The God that can create all of that, you really think cannot create your prince or princess charming? Hmm. Really? Really? No, seriously, really? And for those of you who say, well, I'm too, I'm too heavy. There are people who like heavy set people. Hello? I'm a size 14. I'm not a size zero. There are people who like thin people. There are people who like women who have four degrees. Hey, hey. <laughs> and they don't ask you to dumb it down. Yes. Come on. They Sweet. like that you're smart. Yes. They like that you read. Hey, they hey. They like that you can Amen. talk about, you know, World Trade Center and global, global economy and global warming and all that. They actually like that. They like well, it. Yeah. There are people who like locks. Amen. There are people who begged me for five years before I did it to grow the locks. There are people who like fishnet stockings. There are people who like women with no makeup. There are people who like women with makeup. There are women who like tall men. There are men and women who like short men. There are women who Make like, D.R. and I were talking about men we thought were cute the other day, and I told her she likes pretty boys. I like me a rugged man. And you say, well, most guys, most of my younger um, friends will say, well, most guys like that, you don't need most guys. You just need the one God made for you. Just need that it one. It takes one, amen? That's right, that's right. Amen. <laughs> and then finally, church, to move forward requires a commitment to relationships with God. Mm. Amen. And if you have a commitment to relationship with God, then you can have a commitment and relationship with Come each on. other. That's right. it's, it's really rather simple. Yeah, yeah. A lot of us have what... Uh, I know Pastor Sherry would call, and in fact, she wrote this word, commitophobia. Mm. Scared of commitment. We're afraid of committing to anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Afraid. Not only relationships, but we're afraid to commit a commitment to our church family. Mm. Mm. Right. We're afraid of commitment to church ministry mm. and our relationships with one another. I know uh, an example, my mother and father have been married for over 60 years. They've been attending the same church since 1955. Wow. Wow. In Wilmington, Delaware. United Church, United Methodist Church, they go through pastors uh, because they're uh, itinerant. They, they, they serve for a few years, they move on. They've had every kind of pastor, the good, the bad, and the ugly that you ever want to see. I've seen them just crying. I've seen them uh, uh, dying on the vine sometimes. Because of some of the stuff that's going on in the church. But you see, their commitment is not to the pastor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Their commitment is to God and their church family. Therefore, they've been able to go through everything over the last 50 something years because they had a commitment to God and their church. They weren't church hoppers. A lot of people ran from church to church because of the pastor or something that went, went on. Things are always going to go on in the church. Going people with you, man. Yeah, that's what, right. what, what does the beloved community church really mean to you? Right, that's right. We're not perfect. We know that. We say that every Sunday. Yes, that's but right. When we try to be a church who loves you, a church who loves God with everything that we have, we're not perfect, but we're trying. Yes, so yes. You like, you like that feeling. You like what we're about to. What, what, what's wrong? Well, why don't you commit right here? Why don't you commit whatever church you attend? We're not the only church. Uh, we're just one. But you're afraid to commit to that one. You need to commit to God. Amen? Amen. I know Sister Keisha, one of our newest members, was asking Pastor Shay why she does the programs every week. Mm. The programs that you have in your hand. Uh -huh. there's plenty, she said there's plenty of people who can do the programs. However, what's hard is to get someone to commit to doing them 52 weeks a year. We have 52 Sundays, and we have church every Sunday, y'all. Amen. We could get a team to do them, maybe a team of three or four to do them, but it takes commitment. That's right. Amen. That's right. Another example is our phenomenal children's church. As Pastor Sherry said before, we've gone from about seven children to 25, almost half of this church, 18 and under, which is a great thing. It's wonderful. But we need more commitment. We need more folk than Miss Nisi and Miss Andrea to commit to working with children's church. Sometimes they need a break. That's right. That's right. Amen. I know sometimes they may doubt that and they're not going to get the commitment. 
But I believe that this year in 2014, we will get the commitment, not because of who we are, but because of who God is. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to commit to this community. As a church, we need to be a presence right here in Acton Key. That's right. In Southern Prince George's County, in Charles County, where we are, to help folk and to help folk to transform their lives for the better. We got to get busy through our commitment right here. Right here. This community needs to know that we are here. That we are the beacon of light that can show them the way. Mm. Commitment to our relationships means you have to trust God. you got to depend on God and stop trying to depend on yourself or others. God is the answer. Amen. We've already proved that we can't do it on our own. That's why we fail so many times in the past in our relationships. Yeah. Because God is not in the center. Some folk just don't get it, you see. They stumble and fall and then they get up and say, I'll just try harder by doing the same thing the same way. It's like you uh, go up to a wall and you bang your head against it and the wall doesn't fall down. You try it again and bang and you try it again and bang uh, and you keep doing it thinking maybe it will fall over this time. That's the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. But you see, with God, God can do a new thing in your life. Yeah. We can't change who we are. Only God can do that. I'm not talking about the outer person, you see. I'm talking about the inner person. The real person. The person that was hidden in your heart. Yeah. You see, when someone becomes a committed Christian, they become a brand new person inside. Mm. You see, we're not the same anymore. We, we don't talk the same and we don't walk the same. We don't act the same. Some of our old friends who knew us way back when knew us during our dark times and they don't even recognize us anymore because they're blinded by the light. Not just any old light, but that radiant light, the light of our salvation. It's called Jesus Christ. It's called being born again. And see, so you see, John 3 and 3 says, I'll tell you the truth. Yeah. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Yes. And being born again, you see, is a chance to start over to get a fresh start. It's doing a brand new thing. It's moving forward and making a Holy Ghost commitment to God. Yeah. Through our relationship with God and our relationship with others. So, church, we believe that in 2014, we are going to do what? Move forward. We're not going to dwell in the past. That's right. We're going to be open to new possibilities. We're going to believe in the power of positive thinking. Amen? Amen. And we're going to make a commitment to our relationship first to God and to one another. Is that all right? It's all right. I believe that the beloved community church can move forward as a church in 2014, not because we're so great, but because God is. Yeah. We know we can't do it on our own accord, That's but if right. we're committed to making a change, if we're committed to doing relationships differently in 2014. If we are committed to making a closer, consistent connection to God, amen, that means you got to open up your Bible every day. You can't be in a relationship with somebody you don't know, amen? That's right. If we are committed to being purposeful in our relationship to God and stop doing God and each other on automatic pilot. If we are committed to giving people some slack, give somebody the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Don't you want them to give you the benefit of the doubt? I do. Then extend to them what you want to be extended to you. If you're willing to give each other another chance, why? How many chances does God give you? Mm. If we can commit ourselves to trying to love one another unconditionally, not because we deserve it, because we are called to love as God loves, not for who we are, but in spite of of who we are, yeah. because we believe that it does not yet appear that we are all that we are created to be, because we know that we're still a work in progress, because we know that God refuses to give up on us, even when we give up on ourselves. As we stand all over the church, amen, and we are willing to look beyond faults and to see needs. 